Going to talk about Maria Tash in her patented piercings. Coming up next on Body Piercing Basics, episode number 138. So stick around. For those who are new to the channel, first off, welcome to the Body Piercing and Tattooing channel. Hope you're finding the videos helpful and informative and all the stuff we love to create them for. But you might not know who I am. My name is Dave O. I'm a professional body piercer and have been since 1994. I own and operate the Axiom Body Piercing Studio located right here in Des Moines, Iowa, inside Skin Kitchen Tattoo. So what I'm going to talk about today is two main piercings. The first one being the uh, floating or hidden helix. Uh, the other one being the floating or hidden uh, rook. Recently, I, I got a phone call from a gentleman that's doing some research on this because uh, I guess a studio, I couldn't quite figure out if he represented them or not, um, has been uh, nailed with a cease and desist order because they did the piercing. This seems a little ridiculous to me, so I started doing my own research, and here's what I came up with. First off and foremost, this is not too unique Never been done before piercings. Basically what this is, is it's an upper ear helix piercing and a vertical conch piercing. Um, if you look at this photo right here, it kind of shows you where those angles are and where those placements are. The biggest difference is it's done on somebody with the anatomy that either that helix ridge is so pronounced that it can cover up a stud or that rook shelf um, of the anti-helix is pronounced and kind of curved over enough that you can stick it underneath there without seeing that end. So it gives this appearance when you put in either a bar with two with a chain attached to it or a, uh, a, 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 a post with uh, some type of dangly uh, charm or pendant on it. It gives this appearance that there's not a piercing there. It's just magically floating there. Very unique look, and uh, Maria Tosh has had a lot to do with developing that look. However, I don't know if this is really a new thing. The reason why I say this is I've done piercings in both of those placements in the past. Um, as far back as the 1990s, I've done uh, helix piercings underneath that helix flap for people that wanted to get a piercing done, but... They wanted it on their ear, but for one reason or another, either job or home life or what have you, they couldn't have a visible piercing. So we would pierce underneath there so that they could have a piercing, but wouldn't have to worry about people seeing it all the time. Vertical conch piercings are not maybe as common as normal conch piercings, but they aren't unusual. The biggest difference here is the application of the type of jewelry they put in it which, to be honest with you, is kind of just the next logical step because if you're going to put something and, and hide the piercing, having a gym there or some kind of other setting doesn't really make much sense. You need to put something there that draws attention to it. So who is Maria Tosh? Uh, Maria Tosh is It's kind of hard to separate the company from or the business from the person. Because the business and the person kind of are blended together. If you do any type of research online, every time you try to find out anything about the company itself, there's only one spokesman. There's only one person you hear from, and that's Maria Tash. Nobody else. Um, what I do know about her, I, well, currently they have about 12 uh, locations worldwide. What they are is they're a high-end, high-fashion uh, piercing boutique, I guess, is a way of putting it. The idea behind it is it's about the same you would have an experience if you went into a very expensive fashion-driven uh, retail space and said, I want to talk to a stylist and have somebody stylized my wardrobe. It's the same thing, but they do it with ears. They do it with uh, navels. They do it with et cetera. Uh, they're, and noses. Uh, it, it's a much different experience that you're going to have from a piercing perspective or most studios um, because it, the, the way that they do things. And the way this is different is when you walk into the studio, it's more about going, okay, you, we want to do some ear piercings. Here is a selection of various different pieces of jewelry. Here's a very selection of what I would suggest for uh, what, 
what style of jewelry, what material I would suggest, whether or not the color is gold or rose gold or yellow gold or white gold, um, and what positions are going to work best for your ear. This is all done by a stylist, uh, basically a sales pe- person. Uh, the actual piercing is done by somebody else. Maria, she started off uh, self-taught, basically, piercing her friends uh, and then slowly moved into uh, her first studio, which was Venus Modern Body Art, and then it became Venus by Maria Tosh, and then eventually just Maria Tosh. Um, She's self-taught. I'm guessing that a majority of her uh, education came from the how-to videos and uh, articles that were in magazines like Piercing Fans Quarterly International and Body Play Magazine. Um, Most of what she does as far as ears and et cetera, she has kind of a slightly different take on it, um, especially with lobe piercings and helix piercings, of doing it at a forward-facing angle. And what she means by that is instead of it being angled to the – to the actual anatomy, the way we want to do it, it's angled off so that it's perpendicular with the front of the face or the side of the face. Uh, it's a little different. Whether or not it works or not, it's it's kind of half and half. I guess the part I haven't talked about yet is they also create their own jewelry. Uh, they manufacture their own jewelry. They have a very different take on how the jewelry closures are. Uh, they only work in precious metals. No titanium, no uh, stainless steel, just gold, platinum, and et cetera. She gained a reputation for creating kind of these uh, dangly, more feminine, more fine fine jewelry-looking naval jewelry, um, often with things dangling off of it or chains or et cetera, which, as somebody who pierced in the 90s, I can contest to about 30% of the issues that I saw with naval piercings came from those dangles, getting caught on absolutely everything. Um she felt that the uh, piercing industry at that time was not very inclusive, which is kind of ironic when you think about how exclusive she is now, um, and that uh, it, it wasn't a comfortable environment because it tended to be more on the punk rock or the gay, uh, the gay uh, subculture or gay people, basically, um, maybe little hints of BDSM and et cetera. And she didn't feel comfortable in that environment for whatever reason. Also, she felt that the jewelry was very uh, simple and not complex and not beautiful. But you've got to keep in mind that most of the jewelry that was produced during that period of time was, in fact, the idea behind it was you put it in, you leave it in for the entire lifespan of the piercing. Um, it was more about durability. It was more about not getting caught on things, simplistic, and keeping things simple from the start for the best results. So there wasn't a lot of different things. But the thing is, is all of her jewelry is based off of designs that came about from people at Gauntlet and various other manufacturers early in piercing that developed all these different types of rings, uh, barbells, bray studs, curved barbells, etc. As I mentioned about the, the thing, they have a big thing about calling it curated ears. Uh, they even trade named it back in 2004. Uh, over the last two years, they have basically filed a lot of patents, uh, mostly for jewelry manufacturing techniques, closures, mostly jewelry driven, which I completely understand. And to be honest with you, I'm completely supportive of that if it's a unique and different way of doing things. However, it's kind of weird because you don't have a piercer talking to you from the start. So you have somebody who's a stylist. And the idea is that you have an end result, not so much we heal it out and we work on getting that end result you want, but we make sure that we're piercing with the correct jewelry. They often will pierce with incorrect jewelry, like rings and et cetera, or angles that are off to make it appear in a certain way, when reality is you're going to have a harder heal, longer healing time, and more problematic issues with that than you would if it was done correctly. 
the biggest thing and the reason why I have kind of a problem with this whole thing is the whole point of this experience is that it's exclusive. If you can't uh, afford it, you don't belong here. It's very fashion moment, uh, very catered towards the extremely wealthy and does not really represent a majority of the people on this planet that are actually getting pierced. If you think about it, with jewelry that ranges between $375 and $2,250, $2,250 is the jewelry that is required to do these two piercings or the options you're given. Most people spending four or $500 or two or $3,000 on one piercing isn't a possibility. So if they're the only ones that can do this, it excludes out a majority of people that may desire having this done. Now, let's move on to, is this a new piercing? Should it be patented in the first place? Is it exclusive? Is it something that she's developed? I would say no, but according to Maria Tosh, it is. that This is a completely new technique. Nobody's done this before. This is a completely different thing than anything else any other person is doing on the planet as far as a piercer, as far as uh, doing this uh, particular style of piercing on the ear the reality is i've seen other versions of this done at different angles with different jewelry with the chain attachment it isn't that new both of these piercings are common piercings as i've already mentioned both the floating or hitting rook and the vertical conch um or is a vertical conch. The uh, hidden helix is a helix piercing. These are piercings that most studios would do two, three times a week, maybe more, depending on how busy they are. The only major difference in jewelry type from the rest of the industry that she's using is the back. The back is different. Instead of being a cylinder or a round disc, like everybody else, her studs have a flower type design or shape to them. Really, for the most part, there's difference in the threading um, on purpose to make it proprietary because if you lose an end from any of their jewelry, the only person you can buy it from is them. No one else makes it. Uh, if those are familiar with body piercing and the body piercing industry, most of the high-end manufacturers or the better manufacturers have settled on universal threading. This is what we do for 16-gauge. This is what we do for 18-gauge. This is what we do for 14, 12, and et cetera. So if you lose a part, you can take a part from one manufacturer and it will work with the other one. The same thing with, uh, I think, one of the main reasons why she hasn't switched over or doesn't use threadless jewelry is or manufactured threadless jewelry is because you can use that with just about anybody that produces threadless jewelry the backs the, the posts and the fronts are universal they work on pretty much everything the other thing is is the person has to have the anatomy structure to make this possible and give that effect so she's basically you're relying on the anatomy of the person that is getting the done. Not everybody on the planet can get this done uh, basically because they don't have the anatomy for it. Basically, without the established piercings, the jewelry style, and the person having the correct anatomy, it would look like just a basic piercing. So why is this so different and new from what is the industry standard? The fact is, no one has ever attempted to patent and control doing a piercing. There have been patents filed on various similar types of jewelry closures and styles and designs, which they should be. They should be able to control uh, their own art and profit from their innovation. I totally believe in that. But no one has come along and said, hey, I did this piercing first. This is my piercing. Everybody pay me a royalty or don't do it. A good example of this would be Eric Dakota. Eric Dakota invented probably three or four different ear piercings. He was kind of the first person to focus almost uh, on the ear as a way of doing multiple piercings, including the day for daff, people pronounce it as, um, the rook. Um, I believe he was there at the beginning of the trachis piercing too. Not a lot of people were doing those piercings beforehand. Now, the other problem with all of this is, is we don't know if there is any ethnic or tribal cultures from the past 
ancient civilizations where these piercings were done and they wore this style of jewelry. There's no way of knowing because most of that stuff didn't survive over time. This industry, body piercing, has grown because of the sharing and openness of the original founders of piercing. The people that developed many of the techniques that we use today on a regular basis were developed by people that openly shared it with anyone that would listen. And it is the reason why the industry has evolved the way it has. It would have been very easy for Gauntlet, for example, to come through and patent all their piercings and also patent all their jewelry. And uh, maybe they would still be around today if that was the case. But the reality is they didn't feel that it was their place to do that they felt like piercing was something that would if they wanted to see it grow and develop into something better they had to share that information as i mentioned earlier uh maria tosh has always said that she was self-taught she didn't go through a formal apprenticeship she wasn't uh trained by anybody and the only way that could have possibly happened was if she was reading articles in pfiq uh piercing fans quarterly international Uh, maybe buying the gauntlet videos or the few other ones that were out there and getting pierced by other people and asking a lot of questions while she was doing it. Uh, This, I, her whole thing has been built off the sharing of knowledge from the people who started piercing. She didn't magically appear fully formed out of the womb with all these ideas and techniques. She has stole all of it from other people and they willingly opened up the door, left it unlocked, and let her come in and take it. The biggest thing this is going to create is a situation where if this patent does, because it's currently just registered, if they do obtain the patent, is it will create a situation where they can block anyone uh, doing piercing professionally or otherwise from either not piercing with their jewelry or um, paying them some type of a fee for the ability to do the piercing or flat out blocking anyone else from doing the piercing, basically making it exclusive to only their studios. The other thing is as the piercing is described, it makes it very open for even similar piercings or piercings that have a slightly different placement of being of falling under possibly violating this patent Um, and opening up studios, which are mostly ma and pop organizations they are usually one person owns it or a, they're a co-op of sorts, uh, but they're not people that have deep pockets like a company that has 12 locations and high-end fashion districts throughout the world, including Dubai, London, Paris, Los Angeles, and uh, New York. So it could create a situation where a lot of the main bread and butter of piercing, the people that, that the, the salt of the earth piercers, cannot actually do their uh, do the piercing what they've what they've trained to do in their art form and have been doing for years without the threat of legis- of being litigated out of business and it questions the fact of whether or not a her- a helix piercing or a vertical conch could be do- done without violating this particular patent regardless of what jewelry we put in it and it opens up a whole other can of worms on jewelry styles types and piercings because i can guarantee you if they can get away with this there's going to be more trolls out there filing patents for just about everything on the planet that hasn't been patented already nobody's patented navel piercing so it's pretty easy that if this holds up somebody's going to come along and patent every major piercing that is done and then start suing people fashion is often or high fashion is often about exclusion Um, It achieves this through inflated prices, and this company does inflate their prices. Piercing, in my opinion, is an art form. It is not a fashion design. This is not only anti-competitive, but it isn't in the spirit of the art form. As I've said from the very beginning, piercing has been a very open exchange of ideas and processes. Without that, it would not have excelled to the point that it did, and it would not be what it is today. One final thing on Maria Tosh that I forgot to cover. Uh, It's very interesting to me that through all my research for this, I didn't see one article, interview, uh, statement, discussion 
about the training and the people that pierce there, um, people who had pierced there, what their experiences were like, um, or anything about their techniques and how they go about doing things. All I saw was some footage on one of their sites of them using uh, old school Sharpie markers to mark out piercings, which uh, nobody does that anymore. At least nobody reputable. Anyway, just a thought. Well, this was a bit out of my comfort zone. I hope you learned something. Uh, Till next time, you're hoping all your piercings heal with ease and without a single issue. And if you're in the Des Moines, Iowa area, I hope to see if your body piercing needs in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you in the next video.